the book was trying to make the future not seem scary. Right? It, there are so many books out there that talk about the technology advance and it being a scary world and talk about the challenges as opposed to the positives. And we were trying to, to help people to just think, wow, so this is what my kitchen would look like. This is what my bathroom would look like. You know, how would I travel? What would travel look like uh, in 2030? <laughs> Felix Dodds is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Felix has been a leading thinker in the area of global governance for 30 plus years. Now adjunct professor at the Water University of North Carolina and also at TELUS Institute Boston. He is also an international ambassador for the city of Bonn, he was the UK government candidate to be the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program in 2019. In 2019, after a three-year campaign, he succeeded in securing an annual UN General Assembly resolution on sustainable investment. During the SDG negotiations from 2013 to 2015, he was the advisor to the Ford Foundation grantees on the SDGs and the co-founder of the coalition Communitas that succeeded in lobbying, lobbying for SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. He has authored or edited over 20 books and it's probably still counting and growing. Um, uh, one prior to this was stakeholder democracy represented democracy in a time of fear. He also co-wrote Negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals, and he has been a guest on my podcast before. He's a wonderful person. This is a, a, a fabulous book, Negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals, but we're here to talk to him about a brand new book, Tomorrow's People, The Impact of Disruptive Industries in Our Lives by 2030, uh, which came out in October of this year, 2021, and is co-authored with Carolina Duca Chopita, if I say that right, and Ranger Ruffins. Um, this, uh, and he's also working on another book that'll be out in June of 2022. Uh, it's going to be um, Environmental Heroes in Diplomacy, Profiles in... Um, Courage, basically looking at 10 individuals that have been leaders and, and front runners who had a lot of courage um, to do some great things. And, and I, I don't know if we'll go into to all the chapters, um, but there's 10 chapters and Maria Luisa Voiti, um, Christiana Figueres is in the book, Barack Obama, and just these heroes that have really done some amazing things around diplomacy. And I'll, I'll always with, uh, like any of the books uh, and concerns from Felix, there's always that nice hint of sustainability, environment, and concern for our future humanities. Welcome to the show, Felix. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. How have you been now? It's been almost a year since we've we spoke and, and uh, a lot, lot more craziness going on. So we spoke at the kind of the beginning uh, of the pandemic times and, and the beginning of some craziness. And uh, um, I'd just like to know, besides pulling out an, a, a couple of new books that you're working on, one, uh, congratulations. But uh, how have you been? How have you weathered this time? Um, I, I most of the time I do work at home, so it's not been that much of a change. Um, of course, the uh, clients I have um, that I work with around the intergovernmental negotiations, that's all had to be done um, virtually. And you can't do negotiations virtually. So to some extent, a lot of that until COP26 in Glasgow was um, really just treading water or at least trying to increase the knowledge level of the uh, of the negotiators 
um, so that when they come to the issue, as we move out of uh, lockdown, that they can maybe make better informed decisions. Do you think that the, the pandemic or that pause, what the World Economic Forum is calling the Great Reset, has been a negative um, or positive in the growth for environmentalism, for biodiversity, for awareness, um, and especially in what you just experienced at COP26? So I, I think that um, the pause and perhaps the pandemic itself has given people an understanding of the kind of challenges that we face. And people have often been talking about COVID and pointing out that the climate change challenges are even greater than those that we are facing under COVID. And clearly many governments are developing their recovery packages around uh, green types of technology development. And I think uh, uh, President Biden said in the next 10 years, we'll see 50 years of development. So I think that it's helped the issue, but it didn't necessarily help Glasgow. I think the problem we had in Glasgow, and I, and I think Glasgow achieved pretty much what it could achieve. Uh, and if you think, I mean, just to help your listeners, if you think that prior to, um, to Paris, the World Bank was saying we we're on a trajectory of four to six degree temperature rise by the end of the century. After Paris, we were on, in a sense, a 2.7 to a 3.7 trajectory. And then as we come out of Glasgow, um, I think we're now on a 1.8 to 2.4 degree rise. So in a relatively short time period, um, we have seen, I think, an advancement. Now it's not enough. And of course, those are commitments the governments have made. And we know from past experience, that doesn't mean that they will be delivered on. But I think the trajectory is right. And I think the decision in Glasgow that they will review the commitments again, not in five years, but in one year uh, in Egypt, uh, was an important uh, decision and that the UK presidency, as you know, will continue until the Egyptian COP, that's the way it operates, and it will be up to the UK to get additional commitments over the next year to those that were made in Glasgow. So we're, we're definitely going to talk about your book. I just want to get two more things out of COP, out of COP which it, it, it really ties to your book. It ties to all your work that you do. Um, and so it's not that big of a drift, but I just want to get people up to speed since we're so uh, uh, close to, to ha having left COP. Um, we had this entire year, and it was actually supposed to be in 2020, the UN Food System Summit, and then that was kind of pushed to the pre-summit and the summit in, in, uh, 20, in this year. And um, then we had the climate conference, the, the COP26, and I really expected to see a lot more things in, in regards to food and also the UN Food System Summit transition into there, a little bit more awareness. Um, that wasn't so, so, so strong as I would hope. I had hoped the, the usual players were there, uh, obviously the FAO and the EAT Foundation and the World Wide Fund. And, and there was a lot of outside side events outside of the blue zone, outside of the even outside of the green zone. Uh, at the Salvation Army, uh, Danielle Nirenberg from the food tank, she was doing some, some food events and, and side events, talking about this with uh, different players who were in that area. You specifically uh, were on the agriculture side within the Blue Zone at the COP, kind of doing some things there as well. What, what's your view and your take as far as food at COP26 and, and how that went? And can it can you give us a little insight on, on what you saw, what you observed, but also what you c contributed with, what ended up coming out uh, after you were done? Yeah, so, so I think um, people need to understand what the COP is about, and too often they don't understand it. And so you have two, uh, two subsidiary bodies for the COP. 
um, and they meet uh, uh, normally for two weeks in June. Um, and they tee up most of the text that you would then negotiate during uh, the COP. That, of course, couldn't happen because they weren't negotiating. So though they met actually for three weeks in June, they were much more, in a sense, kind of creating a more of a knowledge base to be able to go into the negotiations. In certain areas, they advanced that discussion. The Madrid COP had asked um, in 2019 for five agriculture workshops. Uh, three of them had happened before the um, meeting in June uh, and a kind of um, summary by the secretariat was produced for each of those, but couldn't be negotiated. And then two happened in September and October before the COP. So you had a lot of material going in based on what, I mean, some of them, on, there was a whole uh, session, uh, the whole workshop on diet, there was one on livestock, there was one on economic and social issues. So that material. And, and even the first day of COP, I think, was the food theme, or the second day was the food theme, something like that. Well, the thing is that those themes don't relate to the text. Yeah, not to negotiations okay. either, no. which is interesting. So I'm glad you're so, telling so, us this. Yeah, so people misunderstood. I mean, it was a good decision by the UK government to have the themes because it allowed a lot of organizations to, in a sense, build narratives, um, but they didn't feed into the negotiations. The negotiations were continuing once uh, in the first week on a number of issues, one of which was agriculture. The problem we had is that we had so much material that had come in and we had so few time slots um, that it made it impossible, and this is what I predicted would happen, within the COP to do anything other than to, in a sense, produce a document that said, we've had these five workshops, these are really important issues, we need to go into proper depth on them and to pass that on to the 20 22 meeting in June. And that's ultimately what they did. Now, a number of people didn't seem to understand that that was happening uh, during the negotiations. And, um, and, and that's a shame because they could have uh, perhaps participated in those workshops. Maybe some of them did. Um, but it was, uh, in a sense, now left until the June meeting to decide what to do with that material. And then in the context of that, it's going to be an extremely controversial area. It's not an uncontroversial area. I was disappointed to see that the Food Systems Summit didn't in some way come into that discussion. Um, I wasn't in the meetings because most of them were uh, closed, uh, except for one end bit. But by that time, it was clear that they were passing it on. So I think that there were so many events around agriculture and food in a sense, gives uh, impetus to uh, the process that will have to go into June and then uh, to the Egyptian COP uh, later in 2022. So the, are, are you also, in, in some respects, preparing or sort of letting us all know that should we have some more pandemics or we have some more variants or something else that... Um, we could see delays just like we've seen now where there might be times where those workshops don't happen where that negotiation could be delayed or or some some just some natural climate catastrophes or pandemics could interfere with how that goes com coming up in the future well that, that's absolutely true and and the workshops that we saw were virtual workshops not in-person workshops which they would have been and the amount of people who were speaking at those workshops was limited because um, what the member states decided to do was to work through their group um, chairs, whether that was the Africa group or whether it was the EU or whether it was uh, the G77 or least developed countries. And the, the problem with that is that you miss the richness that you would have got if you'd have had an in-person space. So, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. And we now go, you know, uh, I think a, a number of organizations, you mentioned EAT, they were doing a strategic look at how they can address this come next June. And I think there's an issue around um, 
kind of uh, financing that they need to look at in agriculture and, and, and how to value all of that. I think that's going to be an issue. I mean, if I took a kind of just, a, if you don't mind, I'll take it just a kind of- No, a, that's a fine, please. Top, top learn, I think. So there were, for me, three or four things that came out. One was the national determined contributions, which clearly we are in the right direction. We still have to do more. Um, the second uh, was the 100 billion, uh, the commitment to reach that, which is clearly inadequate, but is something which um, we're close to, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll get there either next year or the year after. But then there's a commitment to relook at that at a much higher level by, I think, 2023 to 2025. Um, and then the third thing were these coalitions of the willing. So, and these aren't part of the negotiation. So that's the methane coalition, the deforestation coalition, the Mark Carney net zero finance coalition, all of these that happened outside of the COP, but were, you know, were kind of using the COP as the place to make those announcements, will need to be looked at in the next year to see how real they are. And, and in a sense, the, the way of judging how real they are will be whether they set up independent accountability mechanisms to be able to check whether they are actually doing what they're saying. And so that's the challenge that's at the moment being dis already being discussed around the finance initiative, whether or not there can be an accountability mechanism that can say this bank promised this, but they haven't done it, in which case, you know, you 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 call them out or the independent accountability mechanism calls it out. I think then the, there was a whole lot of really good material. I mean, you you were around the pavilions. I mean, a number of opportunities for new coalitions around issues on resilience or uh, issues um, around agriculture uh, that can in themselves uh, have an important role. And I guess my final point, the fourth one is that, you know, um, there's this real, recognition, I think, now that sub-national and local governments can play a more critical role mm -hmm. in bringing forward commitments to the targets, but also into, you know, designing planning processes that are actually going to be built uh, into how their cities of the future will look like. The, and then just the, the final, as we wrap this up uh, with a COP, uh, COP26 kind of the input. So, uh, and, and a lot of this is my takeaways and, and uh, uh, as well that I want to just w the, from nations and countries, we, we kind of uh, are still behind. We have a long way to go. We didn't make uh, quite the ambitions or the commitments that we wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> in, in many respects, we got some things in there about the fossil fuels. We really talked about methane. We also um, you know, uh, took a step in the right direction on the nationally determined contributions. We spoke about the, the 100 billion and things, but we fell short. And I, as you said, and when, when I left on, on, um, on Saturday, it was, uh, it was still 2.3 to 2.5 range. And, and so now there's still that fluctuation of, uh, they're saying that maybe it's a little bit on the positive side, but, but it's still clear up to, to at least 2.4 on, on the top end range. Um, but what, what, what I really did in, in the first week, it was already by Thursday, we'd seen Leonardo DiCaprio come, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, um, on and on. Um, and, and, you know, there was numbers of 10 billion private from the Jeff Bezos Earth Fund, Specific monies in the billions, 1.2 for Hindu Ibrahim, Umaru Ibrahim uh, for indigenous peoples. Uh, then there was a lot of money around food and agriculture given out in, in the billions as well from Jeff Bezos. And then uh, I think it was by th Thursday, we'd already heard numbers of 130 trillion US dollars on private corporations, organizations, and foundations commitments or, or kind of pledges. And I don't know if this is what you meant by the Mark Carney uh, group, or if that if that's separate, and so that was kind of pro, kind of positive that like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, UN Global Compact, and a lot of these private coalitions were coming together and saying, "Hey, we're going to step up to the plate. We're going to try to do something 
And so I want to, I want to get your take and your feel on, on that as well. Um, uh, okay. So, so, so the, the, uh, there is a, a website uh, called sdgfunders.org. And in theory, if those people have made their contributions through uh, their foundations, it should at a certain point be registered into that database. So you can look at each SDG, SDG 13 is this climate one to see what funding is being put available for different things. The Mark Carney Initiative was built on the work that the UN Environment Programme's Finance Initiative has done. Um, and that's looking at the principles for responsible investment, the principles for responsible insurance, and the principles for responsible banking. And those groups came together. And the Mark Carney 130 billion is how can we move the capital markets to, to fund um, the things that we want, the positive things, uh, the sustainable development things, as opposed to the things that they have been funding. And to help that, uh, UNDP is setting up, in a sense, matchmaking systems in a number of developing countries because uh, investors like PIMCO or Aviva don't know where to put their money in developing countries. And so the UN is hoping to try and, in a sense, act as that matchmaker saying, here's a great project on renewables or here's a great project on water that you could do. And so that's an emerging area that's happening. And that 130 trillion, that's the issue where we need accountability. We need to know that that money, those, those, that money that's been put on the table uh, as possible money that can go to this cause is actually going to go there. As the market shifts towards that, to some extent, the governments become less important because the market just reorganizes itself to funding good things as opposed to funding bad things. And then, you know, if you elect someone who's not keen on, doesn't believe in climate change, it doesn't really matter because the, the market's already delivering that. So there's a couple of ways to push that. One is that uh, a number of countries have introduced it as a listing requirement that all companies listed on the stock exchange must have their environment, social and governance reports and produce a sustainability strategy. So South Africa has it, Brazil has it, I think um, Shanghai has it, uh, the Euro European Union is introducing it. If that happens, then companies will have to show, uh, even down to their supply chain, that they're actually doing the right thing or they'll get bad, they'll, they, their rating will go down over time. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really see that as well, um, that in 2020, um, we actually had a lot more taxonomy and discussions around ESG come out. And then July 12th, I believe it was this year, the European Union ESG taxonomy actually went into force. Yeah. And uh, you see a lot of private investors, investors, banks, uh, a lot of people making sure they're up to speed, asking questions. Just since that time, I've been on uh, more than a dozen different panels talking about the taxonomy and, 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 and what it does. It, as we transition into your book, this is a perfect segue because there's you you mentioned a couple of times Elon Musk in, in, in the book and some of the things that he's done. Um, but there's this interesting kind of tweet. And when we talk about the future, uh, a lot of things moving towards the future a lot uh, or to, to our tomorrows. Uh, and I, and I don't know if it's good, are happening via tweet. And there's this one in particular tying to agriculture, tying to food, tying to uh, some of the things you've done, and Elon Musk, where the um, de de deputy general of the World Food Program gives out a tweet, basically, um, to Elon Musk and say only 2% of his money or giving that would be enough to uh, uh, fix world hunger, uh, the problem that they, they have around world hunger. And if you get into the tweet, it's a little bit funny because you're not sure, um, is it really solving world hunger? Or is it just one year of solving world hunger for one year, um, which isn't truly a solution? 
but they came back they did the banter yeah. back and forth on the tweet and and it was you know they the world food program came back and said 6.6 billion us dollars and we could solve it for one year and here's our plan on how yeah. we would outline and do that what, what is that the future of de- not only democracy, but some of the things on how, how these negotiations or uh, not even negotiations, how we kind of uh, spark the, these billionaires to, to get into the game of, of sustainability? Or, or what are your thoughts on, on that process? Kind of tying also into your book, what, you, what you've t- discussed as well. Well, so, so I, th- I think, you know, we know that we already have a food crisis coming by 2030, that we're looking at a 30 to 40 percent um, food uh, shortage based on India and China developing more and therefore their eating habits changing and, and, and the impact that that has. And we have about the same amount of food waste that we do. So one of the answers is to reduce our food waste. And I think technology can help in doing that in a number of ways. I think you know, the future fridges in our houses should be able to be much more precise when things go out of date so that we can eat those things as opposed to throwing them away. And I'm, I'm sure like anyone, I, I sometimes forget I've got things in the fridge that have passed their date. And I think we can do a lot to, uh, to do that in the developed countries to reduce that. And then in developed countries, food waste often is that there is a problem in getting it to market that some of the infrastructure isn't there and that they waste it there. So there's there's opportunities to, to address that. Should we be making these statements by Twitter that, I mean, we live in a world that there will be so many different ways that people will be inspired. And, you know, you have to give him credit. He then asked his uh, Twitter followers whether or not he should do it. And I think they voted yes. And so at some point, I assume there'll be a a deal between the World Food Program and um, and Musk in trying to address that. It's um, it, it's generated money that wouldn't have otherwise been there, so that that's not a bad thing. But I mean, there is a club of billionaires that are working together to try and you know move money into particular areas. And again, should this be the case? Well. No, it shouldn't be. It should be the governments are doing it. But, you know, we only now have, I think, five governments that are giving the 0.7%. I think the US is below 0.2. The UK has just dropped back from 0.7 to 0.5. And so there's less money for development aid than there was. But development aid by itself won't be enough. Um, billionaires giving money won't be enough. They, they can help. It is about changing the market and making sure that in fact, you know, we're supporting the development of uh, good food um, uh, around the world or that we're supporting the uh, promotion of renewables around the world. And that that's that's the big bucks that need to go to that. Absolutely love that. And I love how how you address that. Your book uh, is beautifully written. It's a a wonderful read. the cover is on your background, but uh, that we're seeing here on, on the book cover. Uh, I w- uh, it was kind of lucky. So I, I got the digital version. And because this is your Rutledge publishing and it's kind of was UK based, there was no physical copies in Germany or would get here in time. I says, how about let me pick it up there? And, and it worked out perfect. It, it, it's a great read, but I, I need to ask you a couple of questions that um, uh, who is your audience? What, why did you yeah. decide to do this? And, yeah. and um, uh, what's your hope with why do you say this has got, I've got to bring this out? Uh, that's an extremely good question, Mark. And I, I think um, having, you know, um, been involved with the climate change process uh, from 92, from the Rio conference, having seen how we approached it through many times, doom and gloom, um, and found that that, you know, there are only many, yeah, we've, there have been so many, this is the last chance uh, statements. I just don't think that we did it right. I think we needed to start that conversation. If I had to redo it, I'd start by talking about better health, better water, the, the things that people, 
you know, would like to have in their lives. And I think um, the lesson I have is that, you know, you have so much that's going to change in the next 10 years, and you're seeing it now everywhere in the media. You can, but there's no national conversations about it. There's no discussion about how this new technology is going to affect jobs, what kind of jobs. We're talking about 70% of people being freelancers by 2030. Well, that's a that's fine for the younger generations who are very much more entrepreneur than your generation or my generation. Uh, but for those people who are in the blue collar worker jobs at the moment, who are taxi drivers or lorry drivers or, you know, um, how are they going to be able to deal with these changes? And what I wanted to do was not put another doom and gloom book out there or another book that talked specifically about the technology. I wanted to talk about how the technology might be in your life, how it might enhance your life, but also to raise some questions. So, so in the cartoons that we have in the book and in other places, we try very carefully to, to raise concerns. A deep fake is one of them that we raise. Clearly, privacy is another. Um, so by doing that, we hope that the readership is, a, is a, a greater readership because we've written it as populistically as we can for people to read. But also we're hoping that it will make them think about things because we're not pushing it down their throats. We're just having it as a backdrop to the conversation. I love that. And yeah, there are some some nice, you know, illustrations in, in the book as well. Um, Could I just say that they were done by a Marvel comics artist, John Charles, and we chose because um, Carolina is from uh, Argentina and Peru and Ranger Ruffins is an African-American former student of mine. And so we made this the, the family an African-American Latino mix and they the text you see there is a text that they developed. I had no involvement in that. But I think and it's beautiful. It. I absolutely like it. Not only is it diverse, but it's uh, um, it's kind of an interesting to picture of a of you know what what's twenty thirty look like. What do those roles fit into? There, um, it, as far as uh, it goes on books, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Yuval Noah Harari. I don't know if you know he's doing all his uh, Sapiens book in his illustrated versions. He's come out with two of them now. It's basically, you know, this comic book of, of yeah. Sapiens, beautifully told. And so I think that's nice. This other one is, is um, the most important comic book uh, on earth. I don't know if you've seen that, everything from Jane Goodall and that, but it's all about environment. It's about, all about our fabulous. Well, there is a website called Comics Uniting Nations. And I did the comic on how Santa found out about climate change, again with uh, John Charles. And we tried to uh, make it, again, something that you could read to your, your children, but it also has some adult jokes in there as well, so that it's more of a Shrek approach to, um, to humour. I absolutely love that. I don't know. Um, I've been going to the cops a long time. You as as well. Um, there's a, 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 a Santa Claus, not a Santa Claus at all. The cops, the Sustainer Claus. You uh, have seen him around, I'm sure, before. I, I haven't, but I'm, I'm sure you haven't. Yeah, no. he he carries a red sack and and uh, dresses kind of like S Santa Claus, but it says specifically not Santa Claus, sustain a Claus, and uh, kind of his own way to uh, make it entertainment entertaining to talk about climate change. Um, this book is not written academically, so I just want to make it clear because although you are you are a professor and you teach, um, don't don't anybody suspect that this is going to be boring. But the reason I ask you that question is there is this clear thing that I see in a lot of a, a lot of books, and you know I read uh, four about four books a week uh, um, for for all the podcasts that I do. Um, We've gotten into this this thing. I, it's probably been around forever, but we you start out in the first little bit, almost giving us a history lesson. And yeah. the the funny thing is, and I want to kind of have a discussion, or maybe even hear why from you. 
We're not getting this in school. I never got it in school. Uh, my kids didn't get it in school. My grandkids didn't get it in school. And when I talk to people about environment and climate, there's like the first time they've ever heard of it. But in reality, it's big history. It's actually all always been there. So those who who are well read or have, have these degrees and ha have had to dive into it for their profession um, kind of know about it. But the, it, it, it's something that we're almost bringing those. And so I'd like to get just kind of your point, because you start out telling us about the industrial revolutions, a little bit history of transformations and how we got where and what we got. Yeah. And so, I mean, your point is well taken. And I, I would say that the, I was influenced a bit by a book by Mark, uh, by um, Nick Robbins, uh, which he did on the uh, East India Company. I've forgotten what the name of it is. But I mean, basically, no one in the UK knows about the East India Company. We were pretty evil people. They, they had their own private armies. I mean, we did terrible things around yeah, the world yeah. under the name of it. And it just dawned on me that you can't just assume that people have that knowledge. And, and so it was a discussion in between myself and particularly Carolina, because Ranger came on later, how we were going to start the book. And so, you know, we wanted to make it accessible. But and we've I, I think we've succeeded when you get to the home chapters, the entertainment chapters, the transport. It's got some nice little stories there. But I think we felt we had to at least explain what the industrial revolutions had been and their impact, just so that you started from this at least a, a level playing field of knowledge. And we tried not to make it too heavy. It's a difficult subject. No, it's it's definitely not, not too heavy. You did it very, very nice. And I think it's a I, I see it, um, you know, obviously I've, I've read it before in, in other books. One, you list the references and, and yeah. kind of flow it so it's, it's historically accurate. But it's uh, um, but it's done in a way that it's almost fun to learn. It's a different way of it's kind of like um, uh, is it David Christensen who did you know does the big history and 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 that it's done in a very nice way to get that information because it's a form of empowerment. You've just empowered everybody with that knowledge and say okay, well here's how how we've gone here from history so far so if we take that model yeah. and we push it out into the future how how close is this how how quickly will these things develop and 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 so there's a nice succession progression throughout the book that I really I really like and enjoy there there is one thing and I've even struggled with this myself and so I want to throw this question out to you as well when you talk to Jeremy Rifkin or read any of his books, we're still in the third industrial revolution. Well, so so two things. One is, uh, you're right, it's not written for academics. And, and Rutledge are an academic publisher. So it's a little bit out of their bellywig, but they love the idea of this kind of book. Uh, we have referenced it with, in most cases, it's not, not that chapter that we're talking about. Most chapters don't go back for references further than two years before because yeah. we recognize things are changing so fast so if you want to know more we have tried to give you at least uh directions that you can go in the reality is that the four industrial revolutions are happening at the same time um, and particularly in developing countries um, that you know you're dealing with all of the four industrial revolutions um, and that means it's a bit of a mix and it's having its own different impacts. Each industrial revolution has an employment impact. You know, um, if we take, for example, the, uh, the prediction of uh, Uber that by 2024, their taxes will be driverless. Well, what happens to the Uber drivers who've taken out huge loans to, uh, to buy their cars to be an Uber driver? Well, they won't necessarily be needed, but they'll still have that debt that they've done the taxi drivers as we know already there are um i think it's a number of companies that are trying out these lorries around um, um the uh, highways so they're taking two or three lorries with one driver down there if you go five six years ahead and you've lost all the lorry drivers you've lost all the taxi drivers it's very important that for example, Biden's um, package that at the moment is in front of the Senate is passed because it gives that 
10 to 15 year protection. Those people will have other jobs to go to where their skill base is still relevant. But the changes that are coming, if they aren't in some way helped through that, it's going to have a massive social impact. And we've tried to do that, but carefully. We've tried to also, as you've seen through the book, use kind of popular culture at different points to express things. So, you know, um, if you remember um, Luke Skywalker's um, aunt and uncle in the first uh, Star Wars movie were uh, water harvesters. Uh, you know, so they were collecting moisture from the air. So we try to, where we can, reflect on films or books that we think have people have in their in their you know their have read or seen uh, to try and help them to think about these things as well. Um, and I think that's a huge challenge. It, it, it is, but uh, uh, you do it very well, and I, I think it's it's nice to it. it here, here's the other other thing you do. So you're not talking 2050 and you're not talking 2100. You're, you're talking 2030. So um, it, it's surprising how how many people or how many of us humanity don't understand the exponential function and how quick the future actually can get here uh, uh, of new transitions. If you it would have even asked the majority of us uh, three years ago, that we would have autonomous driving vehicles on the highways in Germany, the strictest, most police place uh, uh, around, they'd say there's no way in heck, but we do. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a different technology. It's a different uh, 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 LIDAR uh, approval, but it's here and it's coming um, in, in those places. So it, it happens pretty quick and you describe that so, so nicely. But what we're talking about, so I mean, the, the underlining tone of it all is the sustainable development goals by 2030, the, the, the date that we're talking about in the future, tomorrow's people, is 2030. And, and how, how do we already start to get a feeling? And this is, I wrote, I wrote the manifesto for the SDGs, kind of how, how does it look and feel to be there? You're doing the same thing in a much grander way. What will it really look like? And how are some of these transformations? In order to reach the sustainable development goals, we need six transformations. So, and one of those six transformations is the digital transformation. Um, coming back to the pandemic a little bit, Boy, we're, I don't think we've hit that, that, that transformation yet. I think we're still working on it. We've seen that uh, broadband is not a universal right, and uh, not everybody was prepared with the technology to educate their kids from home, let alone the Internet. So I'd like you to kind of how, how do you discuss that in, in the book and, and how do you see those transformations being reached? Well, so... So we place the book in the in the global north. Um, and we do have a chapter, as you know, dealing with the south, which Carolina wrote because that's where she comes from. And I think she addressed some of the issues there. Um, in the context of that, um, there is uh, the, the Secretary General of the UN brought out in September our common agenda, where he talks about a future summit. And I have been having initial discussions with a number of governments about an SDG and innovation summit, which is very similar. He talks about it being on the digital issue. I think it needs to be much broader than that. And I think it needs to encompass uh, what the Food Systems Summit did with national dialogues, because I think that's where we have a problem, that people aren't discussing the future. And the future is coming so quickly that they're not. There are points where you can make decisions to either slow something down or to at least create a uh, a cushion for people. At the moment, none of that is happening uh, uh, that needs to happen, and so I think that's that's uh, crucial to what needs to uh, to be done. I think that clearly there's a huge. Um, mismatch between broadband being available just in the developed north forget about the developing countries oh, yeah. who didn't have any of that and that needs to be addressed absolutely crucial but you have seen a whole number of things that will have huge implications as we move forward so um i can't remember what the figure in the book was but that we only had a couple of percentage people who were doing 
tele uh, doctor meetings prior to um, prior to uh, the pandemic. Um, the UK government's tried to now force doctors to go back to meeting people in person. And the doctors union just did a, a survey of its members and 80% of them did not want to do that. 80%. And so we're going to move much more to a situation where health will be delivered, or at least the initial part of health advice will be delivered as a as we are talking kind about. of telemedicine yeah and and you know that we've got in the book that the toilets will be able to tell a number of things that are wrong with you your risk band can be linked into your thing and it can give it a certain amount of information about uh, your heartbeats and, and anything else all of that will will i think be a really positive in fact, who wants to go and sit in a doctor's surgery with other ill people for uh, and take half a day off? I'd far prefer to talk to you as Dr. Mark over the internet and you say, well, look, it seems to me that this is the issue. And then I go off and get uh, the relevant medicine. So I think that will be a, a positive thing. I think the development of some of the robots that are going on, the Sophia robot, where people who are living by themselves and feeling isolated that as we move through the, two, uh, the 2020 to 2030, the chance of having a robot in the home where they can talk and they can develop and understand what your history is and talk to you about your friends or, or, or your you know, former partner or whatever. You may in fact have a robot that looks like your former partner with a face. I mean, all those things are possible by 2030. And I think will add to addressing loneliness, which I think is a, a critical thing. And on old age as the, as the greatest generation or the, um, the generation of uh, the 60s moves into old age, that there needs to be something that helps them to do that. Cause we're, we're moving away from large families to smaller families. But the other thing that happened, which was really good, I thought was that we've worked out we don't have to go to work in an office we can in many cases work from home and i think that's going to over the next 10 years see people moving away from the cities back to small towns where they can be with their family i think that will strengthen families in the long term i think it will strengthen communities and those are really positive messages to give to people now that won't be true for everybody but it will, I think, have a big impact in helping to repopulate rural areas that have, in a sense, lost huge populations because people will want to have a nice place for their kids to uh, kids to live. I think it will have big impacts on education. Will our universities look like this uh, the, the way they do today in the future? I don't think so. If I want to put together a course, maybe I take a course from Harvard, I take something from San Paolo, I take something from Johannesburg, and I create something that is something useful to me. So the opportunities are there, but we need to make sure that we don't increase inequality in the country so that the access to that technology is only for a part of society. And we may need to make sure it is something that we share with developing countries. I think 90% of patents are owned by six countries. We need to move to much better cooperative approaches to developing new patents with developing countries so that they have uh, an opportunity as well. I love that. You, you talked a little bit about... Um, you know, the pavilions and how we're seeing a lot more with the resilience and these uh, discussions, whether they're um, supported by the Secretary General. I was, as you were so correct, I was mainly at the UNFCCC pavilions uh, for the uh, climate conference and specifically in the resilience frontiers and the resilience labs and, uh, um, and the resilience hubs that they had there in the pavilion areas, kind of looking from 2030 to, um, to 2050. And so when you mentioned that we need to, have, you know, the conference, uh, the, the futures conference and, and, and discussions, and that you're, you're talking about that, what needs to be discussed, that's kind of in some respects what these pavilions are trying to do. They're trying to project 2030 to 2050. Um, Matter of fact, in the Resilience Lab, we had um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. I don't know if you've ever met him but or read, read I've this. I've read his minute. books. I, yeah, yeah, it's a, a, amazing, 
amazing. But he was there and we had a, a had actual panel kind of on the mindset of the future and kind of how he not only does his books, but why is he involved? Why is he at a climate conference? Why, why is he at, uh, um, you know, writing about the future and how do we get that that same feeling that you're you're giving us here for 2030 how do we start to what does it feel like what does it look like how can we imagine that how can we use movie magic how can we use storytelling how can we use animation cartoons like you've done to get that feeling so that we can start to engineer create architect design to make sure that we get there because if we don't felix if if we don't what, what's our future um so uh, i i think there are a couple of things one is i, I i'm hopeful that if uh, a country picks up the the suggestion and i did have a meeting with one country's ambassador of innovation on monday uh, in New York, uh, who is, they are interested, and we have to see if they pick it up to run it. I think that what you want, one of the things we need is to look at 2030 and to then look back. What is 2030 going to be like? And the book kind of indicates what some of it is. What are the policy implications now uh, in 2022, 2023 that we need to address? What are the things that need to be done to advance many of the green technologies. Now, as you notice in the book, whenever we come across an issue that's relevant to the SDGs, we actually put down what the SDG is. And that's both an educational attempt because we're hoping the book will be read by people who may not have actually been aware of the SDGs, but we're also trying to indicate that there are some interesting things that are going on there that are really trying to move that, but they need accelerating. They need to be available to more people. And so again, if people are aware that things can happen, I mean, we talk about uh, a moisture collector um, uh, on your house, which for places like Texas or southern states in the United States, um, if I use the United States as the example, may very well become critical to give you at least, you know, a bottle of water a day to be able to um, to be able to drink because you know some of the issues that we're going to see are going to be dictated by a lack of water availability. We talked about food availability. Water availability is also a critical issue. 30 to 40 percent of people will suffer water shortages by 2030. And that's not just in developing countries, it's in developed countries. So if we can accelerate those technologies that can help address that, uh, then we're going to do something which will, I think, um, make, a, uh, make their lives live more livable and perhaps not put more people into poverty. I noticed that in the book uh, and actually at least three places where you kind of talk about that and you, you've you done a lot of work on water in the past, so uh, I would expect nothing else. I I'm always have been a big uh, fan of ambient water harvesting, rainwater harvesting, and uh, with climate change in general, our climate crisis we're having, it's, it's warmer. There's more heat. There's more humidity in the air. That's why the storms are slower and more intense and bigger. And uh, just because you're in a desert doesn't mean that there's no moisture. It's, in, it's mainly in the air. That's why you're sweating to death. There's so much humidity there. You, you get out of the shower and feel like you just got out of the swimming pool, you know. Um, and there are some tools or maybe jobs of the future that are very renewable they're very environmentally friendly that if we put them to practice i think we could be ambient water harvesters we could be rainwater harvesters even if it rains three times a year but if we're prepared to catch every last drop of that and use some techniques permaculture some regenerative ag or some of those those technologies boy then we lock it back up into the ground into the watershed into the cycle of, of the of life again and we do amazing things. And I love that not just water, but many things you kind of talk about, well, what could it look like and how do we get there? And those tools that not only the big history, but those, those innovations or things we've probably heard just when you watch the news or if you read something or if you're traveling somewhere about the ticklings of some of those or kind of like, oh yeah, I don't, I haven't really had time to think about it. 
but I believe you're, you're, it's not even a setup. It's just a preparation that, Hey, imagine this. And, and could you imagine, yeah, you might not be that Uber driver again, but there's an insurance and there's a security that you can continue make money off of that car. That's now autonomous through an insurance setup or that that's yeah. still your Uber. It's doing autonomously. You're safe at home. You don't need to get the COVID or, or any other pandemic, but it's still earning you money for the next five years until you can transition to your, your another t- form of transportation. You're a hovercraft or an electric vehicle uh, director of traffic or something. You know, who, who knows what it could be, but there's so many things like that available. And we list uh, a number of those in the book. We call, uh, yeah, there's uh, the jobs of the future, you know, garbage designers, where you're taking garbage and converting it into things that people might want, or personal data uh, broker, or uh, weather modification police to stop people from modifying the weather, or classroom uh, avatar manager. I think some of the interesting things in the classroom will be the use of virtual reality. So you could put yourself on... Uh, if you remember the four students who went into the Woolworths um, and uh, sat down at the all white uh, counter, um, well, you could be one of those in a virtual reality. You could address racism in a way that we couldn't do through just books, but through using virtual reality. You can walk around and use augmented reality as you go past a building, you can find out what the history of that is. So I think for education, some of these tools hopefully will make our students more knowledgeable, more uh, understanding of culture uh, as we move forward. But I think some of the jobs that are in the future, virtual farmers, you know, we could see our shopping malls converted into virtual uh, farming areas. Uh, I think those are really uh, interesting places to to do. So I think there's some interesting places, uh, interesting jobs for the future. But the issue is how do we transition to that? How do we help people? In the UK election, uh, the Liberal Democrats in 2019 were advocating for a £10,000 voucher, which you could use at any point in your life for retraining. Those kinds of things, that kind of discussion we need to have, and it needs to be something that doesn't become just response that you're responsible for, but that's something that the, uh, the government can help, uh, in a sense, uh, the transition to that, to address transition. I love that. I absolutely love it. The last biggest takeaway, if you don't mind, uh, of what you want to achieve with the book and and what what would you say, this is my hope for those who read the book and and that that find it, that that this is what they get out of it. This is what their takeaway is and how they can maybe use this to improve their futures. I think that the book was trying to make the future not seem scary. There are so many books out there that talk about the technology advance and it being a scary world and talk about the challenges as opposed to the positives. And we were trying to, to help people to just think, wow, so this is what my kitchen would look like. This is what my bathroom would look like. You know, how would I travel? What would travel look like uh, in 2030? Um, you know, what would entertainment look? What would fashion? We may be that you're 3D printing your fashion at home, or it may be that you, you decide to uh, send, uh, to ask for something to be delivered by Amazon or the equivalent the next day. And there's a 3D printer in the local shopping mall, which prints out clothes for you that's less waste than if you were less transport than if you were doing it uh from possibly india or china or or vietnam and having to bring it over less waste is good because we need to conserve we need to create much more of a circular economy for all of our uh, things and you know one of the problems we have with solar roofs at the moment is we're selling them as opposed to Um, renting them. If we rented them, then you would create a circular economy that after 20 years, they would be replaced. Uh, We don't want to see the solar panels end up in the waste stream. And at the moment, we're in a danger of going there. So again, we try to raise questions where we think people need to think of policy options, but not in a way that we hope, you know, creates um, uh, uh, that we're preaching to them about things. 
it's almost like a perpetual leasing model. It's more, you know, it's, it's that you, you always have the latest technology, but it's also getting recycled. It's not cradle to grave. I love that. When, when we hit December, 2030, and we achieve all the sustainable development goals, and we've got the 1.5 degrees of the Paris agreement, and, and we've, We've made those achievements and those determined contributions and, and everything that we're really working towards. <clears throat> is that uh, a new sustainable economic model? Is that is, it, Would you say that the sustainable development goals are an economic model, an entirely new operating system? Or is it circular economy? Or is it donut economics? What, what do you see uh, or, or do you even see us shifting to more ecological and economic models in, in the future is that what that's what we so, will have so so I, I think there's no contradiction between the donut economics and the circular economy at all i mean because you're basically defining a safe place for humanity to to live and in the context of that then of course the circular economy does nothing but support that and so I would see those as complementary to each other. I don't think we have any great uh, green economist that has got a vision that uh, will take hold globally. I think it's more difficult to do that nowadays. So I think it will be an evolutionary approach. And I think if the more we can move to things like circular economy and recognizing that we're under planetary boundaries, but also recognizing that we that is common but differentiated responsibilities that you know we in the developed north have used a huge amount of resources to get our form of development we need to make sure that the the, the global south is allowed is enabled to develop as well but you know we need to make sure they do that in a green way, not in the way that we did it. And so that requires a transfer of funds and technology to enable them to make the right decisions because those right decisions will help create a sustainable planet. You have uh, an innate knack to, to really do politics, democracy, diplomacy, sustainable development, how you weave it all together and, and um, uh, democracy and uh, and politicians i just i i struggle with that and th this next book you know environmental heroes and diplomacy I, I really like that because we need more diplomats we need people who are willing to be bipartisan to be diplomatic to work with each other for for new things for our world so i want to kind of transition into that but that last question that, that we just had, which you discussed, it, it is a nice segue because, um, and, you, and you tickled upon it. So I'm a big fan of Herman Daly, uh, steady state economics or uh, ecological economics. Um, we've heard terms, circular economy, donut economics from Mariana Matsukato, mission economics. We've heard planetary boundaries, which could be a form of circular or donut or its own type of a, uh, economic model. We, we've been working for, I think we're on 50, 51 years or close of uh, ecological footprint. So we use it to calculate earth overshoot. But did we know that we could use it in another way to actually maybe have another economic model instead of just saying what bad we're doing or what our footprint is doing? How do we use that to stay within the planetary boundaries? And on and on. And so how do we tie those, those economic models with diplomacy and democracy? Because we're always kind of going back and forth with the negotiations, the politicians and these models and in business. And how do you how do you do it? How do you tie them all together? So, so I think we're going to see a very interesting attempt to do that um, next March. Um, the UN Environment Assembly uh, has two resolutions in front of it um, to set up a negotiating committee for a new convention that deals with plastics. Uh, one of them, resolutions, um, the one from Japan, just wants to deal with marine uh, pollution from plastics. The other one, which is supported by a number of countries, including Switzerland, um, 
and the European Union, I think, uh, talks about life cycle analysis, talks about a circular economy for plastics. And so they're going to try and build a convention which has the circular economy at the center of its model. That will be, I think, a trial run for the kind of way we might approach things in the future. I love that. I absolutely love it. Um, you you're always have your finger on the pulse on these negotiation, these workshops and things. And, and I'm, I, I just wanted to tickle your new book that's coming out in June uh, enough that, you know, environmental heroes and diplomacy, um, you know, 10 chapters from Luke Hoff, uh, Hoffman, Jeffrey Matthews, um, Iskander Friz, Friuz, you know, um, I also mentioned Obama, Mustafa Tolba, uh, the Egyptian king, you know, France Perez, uh, Raul Estrada Oyala, um, <clears throat> you know, hero of the Kyoto, uh, Barack Obama, Christiana Figueres. There are some amazing stories, I'm sure, going to come out of that. Um, it's probably been a, a nightmare to pull all that together, but uh, I'm excited to, to, to see it and to, to read it. And I hope we can have you back on the podcast again to have a discussion after, after we review that book and, and just to have a catch up because there's so much wisdom and, and that, that, that we need your help to, to, to have that. But can you maybe tell us what, why did you decide to tackle this project as, as well? Well, it's very kind words that you've given. Uh, this project originally came from my co-editor, uh, Chris Spence, who wanted to do this kind of book. Um, and I told him I was far too busy. And then he just hassled me for a long time till we agreed to do it. And uh, the title, as you say, is Environmental Heroes in Diplomacy. But the second part of the title is Profiles in Courage. And so it's very much like John F. Kennedy's Book of 1956, where he looked at, I think, at the same number of uh, senators who, or former presidents who had gone outside their political parties to do something that was for their country as a whole, as opposed to for their political party. Here, what we've tried to do is something similar. These people, you know, some of them, I mean, uh, some of them were scientists, some of them were uh, activists. Um, many of them were either diplomats or were um, playing particular roles in UN negotiations. We have Morris Strong, who was the father of sustainable development as well. Um, Paolo Cabrero, who's the mother of the SDGs. And we thought, well, you know, who were these people? Where did they come from? And so we go back, uh, the, the authors of those chapters go back and look at them as people. You know, how did they grow up? I mean, Morris grew up in the Great Depression, which had a huge impact uh, in, uh, in somewhere near Alberta, um, had a huge impact. And then, you know, how did he get there? Well, he, you know, he traveled, uh, or he, he traveled down Africa and then he ended up in Kenya. He started working for the oil companies. Well, how could an environmentalist do that? And so you start to go and understand them a little and then when the issue that you're focusing on, whether it's the climate negotiations or the Rio conference in 92 or the, uh, the whaling commission, you know, what, ro what role did they play to, to move that process forward? And then what happened to them afterwards? So it's a way of trying to kind of let the, uh, the reader get into understanding uh, intergovernmental processes through, in a sense, the eyes of someone who played at critical role to you know be more than just a government official or more than just a UN official or more than just a scientist but you know really in a sense helped craft the global environmental regulations that we now have I only have six more questions for you I want to have a, a couple uh, uh, light ones as well so we touched upon this briefly in our in our first podcast but you always have these crazy ties and comics and you have these movie uh, hats and, and you're, you're, you're there. Um, but I don't know if you knew, 
uh, that I also am kind of a Marvel superhero kind of person. There's, <laughs> you know, he's reaching in there, old uh, um, uh, Grogo from uh, The Mandalorian, and or I'm a big group fan. I'm a big Hulk fan because of the green aspect and the, 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 the ties to nature um, and that. What got you on that kick? Is it just something that you enjoy or is that because of that, that vision of the future? Is that kind of that yes. movie magic or fantasies? You know, we're, we're both tricky fans. We're both well-versed in, in Star Wars and that as well. So why is that? Is that a tie that, that uh, has a deeper meaning? I, I, I think, you know, growing up, um, we probably both collected comics and then, you know, you, you, you're as an adult, you're not meant to do those kinds of things. And so um, you don't for a number of years and then you realize actually, well, I quite enjoyed them. And so I, I do collect comics. And uh, in fact, I have some that are being graded at the moment uh, uh, to see how much they're worth and whatever. And I've, I've been buying up um, comics uh, with the, the dog Crypto in it because uh, I had a dog called Crypto and uh, crypto, as you may know, is Superman's dog. And uh, there is yeah. a film coming out, The League of Super Pets, uh, which yeah, will be out, super. I think. It's a great I saw, movie. Saw the preview. It looks, yeah. it looks amazing. With The Rock and Kevin Hart uh, playing uh, two of the characters, uh, Rock playing uh, Crypto, and I, I love it. And so I have it as an escapism. I have it as uh, something that, you know, I'd always wanted to do a comic as well, which is why I ended up doing the, the Santa Claus thing. Because I think you get to a different group of people. I mean, you talked about, you know, entertainment and uh, earlier, and, you know, we've got to find different ways to engage with people it can't just be you know all oh, the world's terrible we have to solve it it has to be creative it has to be interesting it has to be fun you know and i think you know if we're able to do that i mean the global goals campaign does a lot of that with the with the a lot uh, music of content, kind of, yeah, comments. yeah and i mean I, and i think those are all very important we have to be multitasking to to engage with people in different cultural uh, venues as well I, I I agree. Pick up everybody uh, where they're at and kind of address yeah. everybody's thing. And, and I, I think in some respects, we all start out at that just the basic entertainment, that basic, yeah. you know, uh, vision of the future, this alternate reality. It could be escapism, but it, maybe you're escaping to a more sustainable place. Maybe you're escaping to this future that Boy, we'd love to have a future where we have have the ability to do some of these things, and it's sustainable and beautiful uh, as well. Um, I, I I really see that as well. There, the, and I don't believe we talked about it in our first podcast, but we have so many dystopian movies and commercials and TV programs and. Um, you know, Black Mirror, and we have TED Talks, but they're a little utopian future, but they're not really movies or, or vi too many visuals besides presentations. But really, everything showing us the future is Mad Max, Total Recall, dystopian, fighting over something. It's very gray. It's very sci-fi. Um, but none of it's this showing us this new vision. And so I, I really think, well, wh how can we show a beautiful, desirable, resilient, regenerative future, something where we've achieved the sustainable development goals, where we've really got this future. And what would it look and feel like, similar to when we were younger seeing Star, Star Trek, and we say, wow, okay, let's engineer, let's figure out how we do a hologram and 3D printer, and let's a food printer, and how, how do we do these things, the tricorder and the cell phones and that, how do we engineer that? First, we, we've got, got to do the movie magic so we can have the vision, but then let's get the engineers, the architects, the creatives on board to say, wow, that would be cool. I want to live in that future. Let's do all we can to achieve that, to, to get us there. Um, you know, in, in your book, in, in, this, in, 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 in your book, Tomorrow's People, that we're, we really discuss, you talk about the future of taxis, autonomous taxis and things. But did you know, basically, you also talk about William Shatner. You talk about that quote of Star Trek in there. 
not only William Shatner go with Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos, he went up to outer space. He was overwhelmed, crazy experience. But on SpaceX, the Falcon rocket, the Falcon rocket that uh, Elon Musk sent up to the ISS or up to um, outer space and back, not only was that fabulous, but I want to tell you, that was pretty much autonomous. I don't know if you watched it from beginning to end. Those astronauts didn't know what to do with their hand. They didn't even have armrests and the whole time, they're not, they had 12 buttons to push. They're not controlling. It was basically autonomous through computers from, from beginning to end. Yeah, they were trained. They had skills they, they knew in case of emergency, but that was already in an autonomous to outer space. We can yeah. do that here on Earth, and in very short time, the technology is already there. We just yeah. need to make it happen. And, and I think the thing with the Bezos uh, Blue um, Origin rocket is it uses uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, so it's not a polluter. Well, yeah. um, I think Virgin and um, SpaceX are. So I think there is yeah. an issue about legislation. Uh, that needs to be passed. Um, Absolutely, and, you know, uh, I'm, 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 you know, I, you, you can't stop people. They've already we've privatized space, and so now it's going to happen. The question is, can we make sure that it doesn't contribute to polluting uh, as well? And clearly, there is a way of doing that. So I think the question is to turn around to Virgin and SpaceX and say, you need to change your propeller system. You know, and if I was basis, uh, I would give them the information to do it as a contribution to addressing climate change. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the other thing is not even a week ago, Rolls Royce just came out with the flat, fastest electrical airplane, uh, you know, single seater. But uh, I think it was 280 something miles an hour you know, and ran uh, for an hour on electricity. So it was, it was absolutely amazing. What Must have been a long there. plug, then, a long plug that they had tra trailing out. The back <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, but crazy. the thing with that, the thing with that is that all that is happening and the hydrogen approach to, to uh, air travel will be, I think, really important. We have a shortfall that we need to deal with in the next 10 to 15 years. And that is we have all these planes that are not going to go out of service because they've invested a huge amount of money. So the suggestion is, and it's not yet being done, which it should be done, which is that what we need to do for hub airports is to make waste household waste to air fuel the intent so you take household waste out of landfill and you use it to convert to air fuel and as you know airplanes can take biofuels we don't want them to take the wrong type of biofuels we want them to take the uh, the waste biofuels but that could be an interim approach which would have a up to 70 percent reduction in co2 emissions um, from those hub airports yeah, I love that. There, there's so many things out there. They're just en endless and we need the imagination and we need those people who say, hey, I'm OK not being an Uber driver anymore. You know what? Yeah. I'm going to go turn uh, 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 food waste into biofuels for the next uh, space travel, the next air travel, you know, or, or whatever yeah. it is. There's so many opportunities there. The last three questions I have, and this la this this first one will be the hardest uh, you have. You've answered it before, but I believe your question will uh, uh, um, will probably be a little bit different. Then, uh, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, I think uh, it's where uh, you know, everyone has enough uh, sufficient uh, sufficiency to be able to live. Uh, and to be able to, you know, um, provide for their family and to be able to educate themselves in whatever way that they want to. Um, I think we all want to be able to have that for our family. And um, that should be, you know, in a sense, a right for everybody. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway, even two messages that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? My message would be getting get involved. 
be be part of the change yourself. Um, this process has, I mean, the, the, the whole book that we're doing uh, that's coming out in, in June is showing individuals can make a difference. And I truly believe that if we all uh, participate in making the world a better place, then the world will be a better place. Why should young innovators in, uh, or what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a, a, a real impact? Well, that, as the book says, the innovation is happening on so many fronts. And, you know, to be young now and to be, to be a, a, I mean, I think young people realize that they can be their, those innovators of tomorrow and that there are so many opportunities for them. And the companies that don't move towards addressing sustainable development will be dinosaurs. They will close down because no one will want to work for them. And the last question really is, what have you experienced or learned in this professional journey, this life's journey you've had up until now that you would have loved to know from the start? Um, I think, I think that, that, you know, um, everyone is trying their best uh, to do what they can. And if you work together more, um, and you don't go in and try and lecture people, but you try and work from where they are, then if I'd known that at the beginning, I would have approached a number of things I did differently. I now realize that if I approach it from, we're all gonna problem solve together to make the world a better place, as opposed to I potentially have the right answer. Um, I think that is both better for me as an individual, but also better for, for the world because, uh, you know, to imagine a world where everybody has an opportunity to contribute and make it a better place uh, through cooperation is better than having a dystopian world where it has to be forced on us all. Felix, thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. I love your book, Tomorrow's People, a new technology. I recommend anybody go out there, get it, read it. Uh, it's a tool. It's also an empowering thing. It's a nice read. And I really thank you for doing that. I'm looking forward to the next one. And that's all I have, unless there was something you did. I didn't get to, to, to let you speak or say. Uh, now's your chance. Yeah, I guess the only final thing is do remember it's Christmas. And many people would like that book as a present. Great. I love it. Thanks so much, Felix. Have a great day. Pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye. Thank you.